tears. Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. Let's talk about serialization and why are we even talking about it? It creeps up everywhere in software engineering, but it even goes beyond that. It goes to everything pretty much in computing. So serialization is the process of taking some data state, let's say in, a, in the form of an object in some programming language and converting that instance and in memory representation into a serializable format, a specific format, we call this a serialized format, um, that takes that data state and puts it in a different format. And this is used to either send it over the web via HTTP or other protocols, or we can persist it in a local file. Either way, it's serialized in a specific format. So when it comes to deserialization, we're able to reverse the process and put that state, that object's data, back into some object or data structure that represents it in some other language. So you can have common properties of some object and you can convert it over to another language. So for example, we have a client application and this client application has a form and you fill it out and you want to send this data over eventually to a server that has a database in the background. And we essentially want to send this information over HTTP. So how do you do that? How, are, how am I going to send an object in C sharp over to some server? That could be in any language. Well, we could use over HTTP, which is a standard protocol, and we want to serialize it in this example so we can get the common data from this instance object, this form data, so we can send it over the web so it can be interpreted as another object in the server, and then validation could happen. So really, any time we want to use serialization, we're thinking about some data structure or some object. We want to save its state, we call it, the state of the object. And in the beginning, I mentioned any programming language. So there's a caveat here. Any programming language that has support for the serialization format. And it's not really useful if you can serialize in a format but not deserialize. So some sort of library would have to do both. So many, many programming languages offer even native support for serializing and deserializing in JSON or XML. These are very, very popular serialization formats. And they're also human readable. So you can like open up the file. You can see exactly what's happening and kind of the format it uses to describe, hey, this is an object or this is a string or this is a Boolean or this is a number. So there's a very specific format. That's why we call it the specific format for the serializer. So again, there are many types of serializations. So we'll talk about two different formats. There's a binary format, which we'll kind of denote as the non-human readable format. And then we have human readable format. Didn't see that one coming. So like JSON, XML, SOAP, and also ASN.1. Some popular non-human readable formats are protocol buffers, also known as protobuf. This is one developed by Google. There's BSON and Seabor. So while researching this video, there's this specific serialized format that does it all, it seems. So it's a binary serializer, but it also can be represented in a human readable format as it claims. It's standardized in the industry. It's typically used in networking and cryptography. Which one is it? It's ASN.1. Now, until I researched this video, I had no idea what the serializer is. So let's jump into the demo. Over here on this screen, we have the client application. This client application is developed in WPF. And essentially, it has a form of uploading a video to this server, let's say. And it has a form with all these details you can set about this video that you're uploading. 
without the video part, of course. Um, so we can save this into a JSON. We use JSON as a serialized format. It's very, very common in the industry. And of course, JavaScript uses it, which is one of the most popular languages today. This is what we distribute to our end users. Then we have our web app, which is our internal application for viewing videos. And it really just shows a screenshot of the video, but all of its details and stuff. And over here we have things like delete or create a random video. And we can also download that serialized format. All right, so as you can see on our video manager dashboard, we have no videos right now. And this is pulling straight from the database because this is an internal application at our company and we're able to just pull straight from the database. But the client application, as you know, can only talk to an API. We wrote an API for our end users to utilize to access some of the video information. So for example, I wanna go ahead and debug the upload video details, and that's gonna bring us in here. What we do is we create a model from the UI, and we're creating a specific model. We're creating an upload video details model, and this is all of its values. So in this class file, we have attributes called JSON property name. For the JSON serializer built into .NET, this is a specific attribute we can mark on certain properties um, to kind of enable us to give them a different name. So in C Sharp, we use Pascal case for our property names. That's a naming convention. But in a lot of other programming languages like Java or JavaScript, for example, we use camel case. So we want to kind of keep that consistent throughout many of, you know, mainstream languages. And so I decided to camel case the properties. And in some cases in C Sharp land, I have is for mature audience as a property, but as a serialized name, I made it is age restricted. So we can have internal names that are different that represent the same thing. And so as you can see, when we do serialize that video.json file, this is the format we get. So now we're about to post to the upload controller and we're passing in an array of model. So we're passing in an array and we're giving it one element, its model. And when we do that, we go ahead and we're at the web API project. Since I'm debugging all these projects at once, we're able to just step through like this. But of course, these are happening over the web, over HTTP. And you know, the time that it takes will vary, of course. So as you can see, we got into this method. And at this point, the models parameter that we have here was deserialized from a serialized upload video details client model into a completely different model called video metadata and actually an array of them to be precise. And this video metadata is our data model. This is what Entity Framework is using behind the scenes in our SQL Server database. If I go ahead and open it up, this is our video metadata's table and this is the object relational mapper kind of class. This is what's relating to the table. So this class and an instance of this class in the context of our database and using it in that context represents a row in that database. And these are all of the columns and in C sharp land, it's properties. So we're in our upload controller and we're going to continue to debug. Here's some null checks and length checks and we apply, we use a service called the video defaulter service, and we give it a list of video metadata that was deserialized in the request. And we apply some defaults. These are other properties that are in our data model, but not in our client model. So if we go ahead and take a look at the differences, um, we can actually go see in here. This class has many more properties. And so this is the class in our database. Um, our client application does not need to know all of this information. And for some reasons, we might not want them to know any of this information. We just want them to be able to know, hey, here's a video title and a description and some other various properties. Here's what you get to do and we'll take care of the rest. 
So I just wanted to showcase that with the video defaulter, kind of adding more property values. Basically in a real life application, this is something that would happen. So we go ahead and add range, we return okay. And in our client application, if we take a look, here's our serialization video. It's a private video in this case. And if we hit download, this is gonna show us a serialized data model. So just to show you the difference, here's our client model that represents upload metadata for videos. And here's the one in the database. So this one has an ID and this one has, um, you know, recommended videos by ID, a playlist ID. Um, this one has a published date, um, which this one doesn't. This has a view count and other properties that are only necessary at the API level or at the company level. So as you can see, this is a real life application of serialization. We're using communications between two different projects. So what we have here is we have a client model and a data model. And in the real world, this is pretty much how it is at the end of the day. There may be two or more models behind the scenes. But really, at the end of the day, the most simplest way is we have two models. They're completely different in their way, but they can be serialized and deserialized into for specific values. And that's what we basically did here. We deserialized an upload video details instance into a completely different class, which is our data model. And then we applied some defaults to other properties that we now allow essentially validation on our API level. So hopefully this explains serialization in a real world context. There's three projects in this uh, demo. I did my best to kind of show like a real life application of this and we're just scratching the surface guys. This is used all the time. How you're watching this video has to do with serialization. Every bit of it probably does. It is so used and this video is just to shed some light and demonstrate it and to also explain parts of it and how to really wrap your head around how useful this concept is in not only software engineering, but in all computing. Thank you so much for watching. Peace out now.